Aibon, Vanakam, and hello. To start, I'm going to show you three images and I want you to tell me if there is something unique in each image in terms of its design, not content. These are three newspaper front pages. Notice anything? Right off the bat, the paper in the middle, which is Sinhala, sticks out like a sore thumb. It has a lot more color, the layout uses all the available space, and it's hard to differentiate between the grid lines, so you might not really know where to look or what to read. The English and Tamil papers, on the other hand, are a lot more similar and contained, although the Tamil paper has highlighted its headlines with some color. Now, I didn't pick these contrasting papers. In fact, all the papers um, that are available here are in high circulation, but if I refer another group of papers, it still has the same look and feel. The funny thing is, I have seen this paper my whole life, but I only noticed these differences when I saw them side by side. Immediately, I noticed how different the news was reported in terms of both their content and their appearance. And this was my light bulb moment. Do all Sri Lankans have a different design aesthetic based on the language of content they are exposed to? And based on my observations, the answer is yes, we do. And if it is the case in Sri Lanka, a multilingual, a multi-ethnic, a multicultural country, it could be the same in other countries which has a similar dynamic. So in creating database or an infographic that reaches a wider audience, we now have new conditions to think about. And this is what I want to talk about today. How to identify if your audience of different languages prefers a different aesthetic? What factors to consider to bridge this gap? and how to increase data visualization visibility in a culture that isn't currently data fluent. Before we dive in, let me share a little bit about myself. I live and work in Sri Lanka, an island nation to the south of India. We're formerly called Ceylon and probably famous for our tea, tourism and cricket. Of course, we've been in the news for our socio-political crisis and we've experienced internal conflicts for over 30 years that um, ended around 2009, an attempted coup in December 2018 and East attacks which devastated the country in April 2019. We are a diverse nation of 21 million individuals. A majority of our population is Sinhalese and Sinhalese Buddhist to be exact. We ha also have other communities of Sri Lankan in Tamils, Indian Tamils, Moor, and others following what we call the four major religions. And we've always been multicultural, mainly because of our strategic location in the Indian Ocean. So within our country, we have three official languages. And by official, we mean that the publications of the government and the notices should be available in these three languages. And they are Sinhala, Tamil, and English. And the most common language is Sinhala. So how do all of this tie into database? When I was working as an economic researcher at Verity Research, which is a Colombo-based think tank that does research on economics, politics, media, and legal research, we had to find ways of communicating our research findings to the public. This involved turning a 10 to 20 page policy paper into bite-sized infographics, and our primary language of research and analysis was English. And we would create all of our infographics in English, translate them into Sinhala and Tamil, and disseminate them. What we noticed was that our English content was getting um, circulated, but we didn't see much traction from the Sinhala and Tamil content. It was harder to get them published in newspapers as well, which was another media that we wanted to approach. So we had to figure out how to reach and attract the audience who viewed predominantly Sinhala and Tamil content. And as we started to explore this, the key notices became evident. Let's go back to the first image. It is clear that the Sinhala paper stands out, with more color, larger headlines, and different fonts. And it's not just this paper, but most Sinhala newspapers over a period of time and across publishing houses. And the same can be said about Tamil and English newspapers. They keep to a particular design aesthetic, or vibe if you want to call it. So this brings me to point number one. How do you know your audience has a different design aesthetic? To begin with, look at newspaper front pages. Why newspapers? First of all, they publish in one language. It's very rare to find a national paper that is multilingual. And secondly, 
The physical newspapers are considered a dying medium. So in order to attract readers, they strive to make front pages as attractive as possible to the reader. So the design aesthetic must appeal to their primary audience. Now we notice this busy, loud posts in singular newspapers. This is also prevalent in social media, especially in memes. So when we compare memes across languages, those noticeable differences also appear here. For starters, singular mediums often contain a lot of font and these cartoon faces, lots of them. Tamil memes have lots of references and images related to Hollywood, that is Tamil cinema. And overall, there's a noticeable difference in the aesthetic um, as well. So English memes would have their content usually aligned to one image, not angled with a usual bold sans serif font. Singular memes would be quite busy using italic font. And Tamil memes would have lots of movie imagery and text that looks like subtitles. So aren't these differences similar to what we noticed in the newspapers? While it may be difficult to notice off the bat, the more you look, the more you will notice these striking differences. Typically, memes are what one has to compete with when making an infographic in Sri Lanka, because people rarely use the website to look for information, but largely get their daily information just through social media. So when the thread is flooded with memes and headlines, your infographic needs to appeal by being familiar and aesthetically grabbing. It needs to make them stop scrolling and pay attention. Now, as a self-taught data visualizer who, has to, who had to read books, articles, and tutorials online, mainly in English, also because my primary medium of information consumption is English, I operate with a, with a design aesthetic that appeals to a viewer who mostly consumes English content. That is, with a clean layout, white space, eliminating all distracting features, almost minimalistic. While this would appeal to a person who views content in English, a viewer who is exposed to a more singular or Tamil content might find these posts to be lacking or even unattractive. And that is why it's important for us to recognize this. Your current work might not involve multiple languages or aesthetic differences, so this might all seem new to you. Or you might be dealing with this every single day and trying to find that balance, the sweet spot, the holy grail, just like me. Either way, we need to recognize that the cultures and languages have their own aesthetic and our content need to ad be adaptable because we have to create more communicable data and information. So how do we bridge this gap? Well, we need to start looking at the distinctive design features of the different languages and adapt to them. We've already begun to notice these differences, but let's look a little closer. Layout. This social media post in Singular from the first look looks quite busy, but it was shared over a thousand times which is significant for this site. The colour and layout worked because most viewers of Singular content were used to this. They considered this to be familiar, not loud. But if we had posted the same in English, it might not have been equally well received. And the same can be said about colour. The post on COVID that you see here was a part of a larger infographic that was run in English. So the colors are more jewel toned and darker. The post on the right was made for a website that tracked the budget, and these posts were to be available in all three languages. So the color scheme here is brighter, more primary color related, to appeal to other audiences, like the Singhala and the Tamil viewers. Another funny thing we noticed is that Tamil and Singhala content almost had no use of teal or aquamarine in terms of their color scheme while it was abundantly used in English content. So we actually had to reduce these colors and go with the primary set of colors, which is quite different to our usual aesthetic. In terms of font, I'm sure you'll notice by now that Singhala and Tamil fonts are much more circular than English. They often take up more space in writing as well. So while the layout has to be adjusted based on the length of the text, we also have to be mindful of the typeface of the font that is selected. Let me show you an interesting example. The headline here uses multiple fonts, but there's a significant variance in the text in yellow. It is more square than the regular letters. By making a traditionally round font square, it gives it more weight and makes it stand out more, increasing its significance. Now, the square font is not very commonly used in publications and often seen in headlines. And Singular doesn't have many typefaces as English does. 
So the fonts tend to be more unique to particular conditions, like regular publications, headlines, memes, and even protest posters have their own unique font and feel. So if we were you to use this common meme font in an infographic, it would give a more casual feel. And if you want to communicate something more serious, it's not the best way to go. It's like using comic sans in anything other than Archie Comics. So in English, while we try to make letters have more weight by making it bold, in Sinhala or Tamil, we can do the same by making it more square. It might not look attractive with English fonts, but it works very well in Sinhala. And images and icons carry the same weight. Now, we look at icons online, there are lots of image repositories we can get um, in influence from. But we have to make sure that it's relevant to our context as well. Let me take the example of the concept of savings. When I do a general Google search for a savings icon, I see lots of piggy banks. While this might make sense in some countries, the tills that we use to collect change in Sri Lanka don't look like this. It looks like the till on the bottom over there. In fact, if we use this poster, people might wonder why there are lots of pig icons everywhere. And, even, and it might even be offensive in some religious contexts. Of course, this might not be directly related to language variations, but you must keep in mind the cultural context when you're taking a particular icon into context. For example, the skin color or the hair color should match the country. Also, we must be able to differentiate between the types of icons that are used. So Sri Lankan newspapers use a lot of cartoon or cartoonish icons while using less 2D icons. So if we were to use similar um, icons in our infographics, like the ones that are hand drawn, people might find that more familiar. And the narrative is another thing that we have to make adjustments with. So similar to how the aesthetic is different between languages, the narrative we see also changes. Now articles in English newspapers, we find, are a lot more analytical, while Singhala and Tamil follow a narrative or a storyline. As a result, when we create an infographic, it also needs to read like a story. So here we have a policy paper that we drafted, and on the right you see the infographic. Now the policy paper has a lot more direct content and it has bullet points and very informative information. However, when we created the infographic, we had to let it run like a story and tell that path in a narrative style. Now you may wonder if I have found the one infographic template to rule them all. Technically, no, it's a process I'm still discovering, but there are certain things that I've learned along the way that will certainly help. First, Create the infographic in the language of your primary audience. In my case, I had to make the switch from creating graphics that would look good in English to ones that would look good in Sinhala and Tamil. In some occasions, the first graphic created was in Sinhala and then translated into the other languages. Secondly, you need to collaborate with people who know the content creation based on the language. Because my general design aesthetic is primarily aligned with an English-speaking audience, I need to check with my colleagues to ensure the colors, the text, even the charts make sense and appeal in Sinhala and Tamil for their content viewers. You also need to build a repository of resources like fonts, icons that can be shared. For example, a lot of online design platforms like Canva can only accommodate very limited type of Sinhala or Tamil fonts, almost none at all. And this significantly limits the use of these software that is freely available online for people to use and create data visualizations. So these two posts that we see here are basically created based on the observations that we've made so far. So we know that primary bright colors are used in local papers. And once we leave out all the political affiliations and the cultural context, the color scheme that we have selected or used here is yellow, black, white and grey. And this scheme has worked really well. These posts got a lot of traction, but of course that came after a lot of editing and refining. Of course, your data visualization efforts would be limited if your country isn't data rich or uses infographics. And this is the case in Sri Lanka. To be honest, it can be very rare to find a, even a graph on a newspaper. But that doesn't mean it lacks significance because while there is no market, you can certainly make one. In the case of Datavis, there are three key things that I see that has worked well in making this transition. 
Firstly, start with small posts. You might have an Excel sheet full of data and pages full of analytics, but it's likely that no one will be able to digest them all. But if you break it down into bite-sized chunks and serve it to your audience over a period of time, without even knowing, they would have eaten a whole slice. And that's what we did with Budget Promises platform at Verite. The analysis had lots of information which was available on the website, but the infographics were on one topic only. Secondly, provide an attractive finished product to be published. In the articles, for example, without having a graph as a figure, include an infographic as an illustration. So we have seen occasions where articles were published without the graph, although there was a reference to it in the text. By making it less of a graph and more of a visual, you are including it within the narrative text and giving the publisher something more to publish that is colourful, that attracts an audience. We also notice that this works well in press conferences and giving the press a physical or electronic copy of the infographic so that they can publish it directly. And of course, use storytelling. We've had multiple talks in Outlier itself on the importance and the use of storytelling in database. And it's key here as well, because as humans, we've heard stories way before we saw or read numbers. So stories carry a strong connection. I admit, it seems much easier said than done, but it's taking these steps that matter. Take the step to recognize that your audience is different based on their language, culture, and content exposure. Recognize their differences in aesthetic from where it originates and how it differs from what you're used to. Take time to adapt your skill set to that aesthetic so that you can appeal to a much broader audience, even if that means unlearning or relearning some new principles of design and narration. There will certainly be growing pains, but at the end, the result will be far more rewarding. And you might have just created one infographic or even made a whole data visualization culture where there was none. By attempting to recognize, investigate, and bridge this gap, you not only solve a data visualization problem, but you're solving a human problem. And it's time for the shout outs. Thank you, Data Visualization Society and Outlier organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. A huge thank you goes to Verite Research that got me into DataWiz and kept me going um, where I've learned so much um, and it made me grow in this field as well. Uh, shout out to everyone, all the staff and all of my colleagues there who has helped me throughout and who have contributed to um, this topic as well. You should check out some of their work and I'm put them in the links here. I also have to thank my mentor from Outlier, Riva. You've done a fabulous job of curbing all my ideas in and giving me some fabulous insights. It was a pleasure working with you. I learned so much. And, and thanks goes out to my friends and family who gave me their input, their thought, and their precious, precious time and patience um, that got me here so far. Thank you so much and I hope you have a wonderful day.